Come on, it should be further down here. I hope so. This place hasn't exactly been friendly. Well, that's what happens when stuff gets abandoned. Nature is pretty fast about taking things back, and it doesn't play favorites. Still, would be nice not to have to fight for our lives for one week. No rest for the wicked, I'm afraid. Ah, here it is. I think the Twelve, it's all still here. Again with this Twelve stuff. Do you even believe they exist? I guess I'd say yes and no. I believe in the ideals they represent and the hope they bring. I don't believe in some entity sitting on a cloud, looking down on and judging me every day. If the gods do exist, they have better things to do than watch me read. Makes sense, but I can't say I know much about them past their number and having to do with the elements. Well, here. Help me look through these and I'll explain while we search. Sure, what are we looking for again? The History and Advanced Practices of Aetherology written by a Charlian author. I want to compare their notes against what I found in the Thaumaturge Guild. We butchered a small legion of monsters for a book on spellcraft? Will you just help me look, please? As for the Twelve, let me start at the beginning. The worship of the Twelve is something that's rooted primarily in Eorzea, but it's something that's been a part of Eorzea's culture for more than 5,000 years. Even during the days of the Elegant Empire, references to the Six and Six deities can still be found. No one knows exactly when or how the worship of the Twelve started. It can be assumed the earliest evidence of their worship would be the second umbral calamity, the Calamity of Lightning. Regardless, we see evidence of their influence in our daily lives. After all, there are 12 months, and modern astrology uses a 12-year cycle. I'm going to be sick of the word 12 by the end of this, aren't I? Yeah, probably. So, even without these gods, the number 12 is kind of all over the place. It's kind of crazy how often it pops up from a historical point of view. While the gods are rooted in Eorzea's creation myth, the mythos itself had multiple different iterations. But thankfully, a wise Charlian named Lufon spent years picking them all apart and put together what he believes to be the original creation myth. And since Lufon was an overachiever, he created the spell school of astromancy while he was at it. But allow me to quote the Twelve's creation myth. In the beginning, there was neither light nor darkness, only the whirl. It was not until Althic emerged thence in his nakedness did time take its first steps forward. With him, the Keeper also carried weight, and with weight were the realms of land and firmament defined. Yet Althic wouldn't be alone over long, for soon, from the whorl, did another step forth. Her name was Nimia, and she was but a mewling babe who could do naught but weep, and soon her tears had created a vast lake. Althic, seeking companionship in the early realm of his creation, took the goddess under his wing and cared for her as one would a daughter. As Nemia grew, however, so too did their love for one another, until it could no longer be contained, culminating in a divine coupling which resulted in the birth of two holy daughters, Azima, the sun, and Menfina, the moon. And with their advent was day and night conceived. So did countless cycles of light and darkness pass before from the whorl, once again, did another step forth. Thaliac, bearer of wisdom and knowledge, looked upon the silent, unchanging lake left behind by Nimia's tears, and coaxed from it a river to carry that water to the far corners of the realm. Azima, drawn to Thaliac's sagacity, professed her love to the new deity and begot him two daughters. Limlane, who took the water created by her grandmother and expanded it into the world's seas. The second daughter was lonely Nafika, who, 
wanting for companionship, created her own playmates, and thus brought life into the world. It was not until life had spread throughout the land and newly created seas that a new god appeared, though whence the others did not know, for the whirl lay dormant. His name was Oshan, and where he wandered did towering mountains rise from level plains. With formation of these spires did cold wind flow from on high down to the warm seas and back up again, carrying life that was once reserved for land and water into the skies. Those winds did bring love into the heart of Limlane. Yet though she longed to be with Oshan, his wanderlust prevented the two from ever being joined ever long, and lo, did they never beget children of their own. This was a time of great creation, but also great chaos. Oshan's mountains rose and fell at his whims, Thaliac's rivers flowed hither and thither, and Limlane's seas ever expanded, swallowing entire swaths of land before the gods even knew they were gone. To bring order to this chaos, Nimia pried forth a mighty comet from the heavens and gave it life, directing it down to the world that it may destroy the excess her sons and daughters had wrought, while bringing harmony once again to the realm. And for many days and nights was the world calm, the gods content in the order which now reigned supreme, that is, until the whirl woke from its slumber and beckoned forth two final deities, Bargat and his younger sister, Halone. It was feared that the untamed and ambitious siblings might once again usher chaos unto the world. So to see that they were properly disciplined, Nimia quickly made them wards of Rolger, the Destroyer. A builder by nature, Bargat resented his newfound stepfather, who could teach him only destruction, choosing instead to spend most of his time in the tutelage of Tholiac. The scholar bestowed upon his eager student the knowledge he would use to forge the tools and techniques of creation. Though more open to her new stepfather's teachings, Halone too grew restless, longing to test her strength. An opportunity arose when Oshan invited the young goddess on one of his journeys. It was during these travels that Halone's ambition slowly transformed into a lust for battle. While on the road, she would challenge every creature she met, honing her skills and methodically devising new techniques for killing. When Nafika, mother of life, learned of Halone's wanton destruction of her creatures, she was angered beyond words and swore revenge. But the fury ignored the matron's challenges, widening the rift between the two. Oshan, feeling responsible for this rift, devised a plan to calm Nafika. From within the mountains of his creation, Oshan summoned a font of magma which spewed forth onto the land. Upon cooling, the magma took the form of the twelfth and final god, the dual-aspected Naldthal. With Naldthal, Oshan had provided a god to oversee the souls of those who met their deaths, and provide them with peace in the afterlife. Satisfied that her creations would no longer wander the void aimlessly, Nafika agreed to a truce with Halone and with the advent of the twelfth and final god was the pantheon complete. But before they could call an end to their toil, they first required a realm in which they could reside and watch over their myriad creation. To this end, they created the seven heavens, and to there did they finally retreat, bequeathing the rule of Eorzea to mankind. I didn't know creation myth was so... involved. Right? It explains the world, life, death, and more than a few phenomena we're used to seeing. 
It's no wonder people gravitate to the Twelve so easily. They give context for things people don't understand while also remaining familiar. But what's that world that kept creating them? No one knows. Could be an Elder God, or some kind of uncontrolled cosmic power, or just a natural force. Your guess is as good as anyone's. So, let me get this straight. Althic, god of time, and Nimia, the goddess of fate, were born from the world, got together, and that made Azima, goddess of the sun, and Minfina, goddess of the moon? Yes. Then Thaliac, god of knowledge, came from the world, met Azima. They also got together, making Limling, goddess of navigation, and Nafika, goddess of abundance. Correct. Then Oshan, god of wanders, just kinda shows up, and Limlane falls in love with him, but he's not entirely interested? Yeah, he kinda just arrives. It doesn't say he came from the Whorl, either. He's just... there. Then Nimia got mad at the god's reckless behavior and threw a comet at the world to teach the younger deities a lesson. That comet became Ralgar, god of destruction. Yes. Then Burgot, god of the arts, and Helone, goddess of war, were the last deities to come from the world, and were put under the care of Ralgar. Burgot hated Ralgar's domain, and was tutored by Thaliac instead, but Helone enjoyed Ralgar's domain a bit too much. And? And Oshan made Nod Thal, god of commerce, so Helone's love for battle wouldn't ruin the world. A bit reductive, but yeah, that's the creation myth in a Kuponut. Well, that explains how the gods came to exist and what role they played in making the world, but it doesn't really explain all their jobs or what their heavens have to do with all this. True enough. Lucky for you, I've studied in Charlene astrology, so we can discuss that too. It's said that when people die, their soul goes to one of the heavens best suited for them. We begin at the first heaven, or the heaven of earth, where Althic, the keeper, and Nafika, the matron, reside. As you now understand, Althic is the god of time and observer of space, while Nafika is the goddess of life and nature. Althic is just spending time with his granddaughter then. In a wholesome way. Nafika planted a holy seed. Althic used his power over time on it, making it rapidly grow into the world tree, which is a constant source of life. Under and on its branches rest the souls of naturalists, farmers, historians, and archaeologists. And botanists. Most likely, yeah. People pray to Nafika for fertile harvests and healthy lives. Meanwhile, being the first god, Althic is mostly worshipped by leaders and overseers. Often you'll see the heads of households wearing his symbol. You'd think there'd be more worship for a god of time, but I barely heard Althic's name. Well, time's movement forward means change is inevitable, and change scares most people. But that's why Althic is so caring and nurturing. He understands that while sometimes terrifying, change is necessary for growth and improvement. A lesson he learned well since he's been around from the beginning. After that is the second heaven, the heaven of fire. That is where Naldthal, the traitors, created a city of gold. The bricks and mortar for this city were forged from the sun that Azima the Warden created. This city is where all the honest, just, and philanthropic souls can find sanctuary. So why is Nald Thal's name split up sometimes? Nald and Thal are technically twins. Nald Thal is the singular deity they create when together. He's the god of the dead and commerce, which is why you see so many tradesmen and undertakers praising him. Meanwhile, Azima is a goddess of inquiry and righteousness. As the Sun Goddess, she serves to illuminate and cast down the wicked so that the just may revel in her light. So the God of Death and Balance works with the Goddess of Illumination and Justice. That's fair. 
Though a city of gold under a blazing sun sounds like an oven. But that explains why some people aren't as scared of death. It's easy to move on knowing someone is waiting for you and plans on judging you fairly. Of course. Nothal is pragmatic, able to judge the value of a coin and the integrity of your soul. He's the ultimate appraiser. Meanwhile, nothing can hide under Azima's light. All truths and lies are laid bare in front of her. Next up are the two living within the third heaven, or heaven of lightning. Byrgot the Builder, and Ralgar the Destroyer. You've got the Rebellious Creator and the Wrathful Destroyer on the same heaven? I didn't put them there. In the Heaven of Lightning stands a massive mechanical tower. This tower was built by Byrgot as a testament to creation and advancement. Ralgar wasn't too happy that his stepson quite literally did the opposite of what he was told and often strikes the tower with bolts of destructive lightning. But it's that same lightning that fuels the tower and keeps it powered since the tower itself was designed to absorb Ralgar's rage. So destruction fuels creation. And vice versa. Makes sense. So what souls live on this heaven? Well, inside that tower the souls of architects, revolutionaries, and conquerors of evil are able to rest. So gods of the same element can be polar opposites. I suppose that means the elements themselves are just as versatile. Indeed. Creation and destruction are two sides of the same coin. One cannot exist without the other. Just like how no one element is used purely for good or evil. Everything is relative. I assume, then, that creators, builders, and artists pray to Burgot for guidance while those who pray to Ralgar usually pray to be a force of nature like destruction itself. Indeed they do. Following that is the fourth heaven, the heaven of wind. Here rests a breezy mountain range that overlooks a mighty ocean. Oshan the Wanderer stands atop these mountains and looks down over the sea ruled by Lim Lane, the Navigator. Limsa Luminsa is always talking about the Navigator. Understandable. The ocean is her domain, as well as the winds that roll over it. Wait, a goddess of wind is in charge of the oceans? Not water or something like that? Strange, I know. But I guess it's because the ocean's currents carry things beneath the waves, much like how air currents carry things through the sky. As the goddess of navigation, she guides these currents regardless of where they are. What about Oshan? Does he live on those mountains? Kinda? He sort of comes and goes. But his mountain range is where the souls of adventurers, explorers, saints, and guides are able to rest. So people who want safe travels probably pray to Oshan, and anything involving the sea is a prayer for Lim Lane, right? Indeed. And anyone praying for guidance during tough choices usually pray to them both as well. The fifth heaven, or the heaven of water, is a majestic river overseen by Nimia, the spinner, and Thaliak, the scholar. The river was created when Nimia melted a star into Thaliak's ewer. He added the essence of knowledge to the ewer, and once it was turned over, the eternal river began to pour from it. Ah. So I take it the souls of scholars, teachers, and wise people relax on or around this river. And you'd be right. But apparently inventors and entrepreneurs can be counted among them as well. So, as a self-proclaimed professor, you prayed a Thaliac to find your books, right? I never called myself that. But technically I could also pray to Nimia too. She's the spinner of fate and watcher of stars after all. A while back, you said fate or destiny ruins the idea of free will. It does, but in this case, you can say she's spinning together threads of possibility that become the tapestry of your life. If just one of those threads was right, then I guess it was fate in a weird way. Wait a second. Now that I think about it, I've seen Thalic's symbol before. The Archon Louis Swa had that symbol on his staff. Observant. Yes, his staff was called Tupsimadi, and did have Thaliac's symbol. 
Some rumors even say that the staff was blessed by Thaliak himself, making it uniquely powerful. Didn't Lui Zwa try to invoke the Twelve during the Seventh Unruh Calamity? Why didn't it work if he already had Thaliak's blessing? That... Uh, is hard to explain. And maybe we'll get back to that another time once we're done here. But finally is the Sixth Heaven, also known as the Heaven of Ice. That's where Holone the Fury and Menfina the Lover resides. Love and war are in the same place? <laughs> this feels strange. Understandable. Allow me to explain. Holone used her spear to carve a palace of ice out of the moonlight that came from Menfina's moon. It's within these halls of crystal ice that the souls of champions, honored knights, and faithful lovers reside. So while home to the goddess of war, it is also built from the rays made of the goddess of love. I take it so that even violence can be calmed by mercy and compassion, right? Exactly. Violence can be born from defending the things we love, but it's also that same love and empathy that stops a weapon from harming the innocent and defeated. Action and restraint. Precisely. Well, from what you've been saying, there are clear themes here. Each of the twelve gods represents something important to our lives and has a partner that complements them. It's all connected. So now that we've covered the gods and their domains, you tell me where you've seen them worship the most in our travels. Let's see. Like I said, the people of Limsa Lumensa practically adore Lim Lane. People in Ulda seem to worship Nan Thal. Not surprising since they're heavily focused on mercantile trade. I think I saw Nafika's symbol in Gridania. Over the Conjurer's Guild. The people of Alamigo still worship Ralgar. And I've heard too much about Halune from Ishgard. A lot of talk about heresy up there. Thankfully, they've recently calmed down a lot. But good memory. Though, you could also add that the once respectable civilization of Nim worshipped Oshan. The islands of Old Charlian have shrines dedicated to Thaliak. And the Makote, as a race, hold Azima and Menfina in high regard since they are seekers of the sun and keepers of the moon respectfully. But I doubt I had to remind you of that. True, but I have not thought about this stuff in a while. I forgot just how involved the Twelve are on this continent, let alone everyday life. Now you understand why people value the idea of the Twelve so much despite their silence. No matter what you do in life, it feels good knowing there's someone smiling down at you with approval so long as you live humbly. Eorzea itself is called the land touched by the gods and forged by heroes after all. What about the seventh heaven? If no gods live there, do no souls live there? Well, the seventh heaven is undefined. I personally like to imagine the seventh is beyond life and death, where one becomes all and all becomes one. Like perfection, it's a finish line to run toward, but never to be crossed. Which is why the gods themselves never reside there. Makes sense, I guess. So I take the Hells are basically the awful versions of the heavens where all the trash of the world goes. Yes, basically all the good things happening in the Six Heavens have side effects which created the elemental Hells, causing misery for the souls trapped within them. Bandits, murderers, thieves, traitors, cowards, defilers, and basically anyone without any sense of standards fill up the Six Hells. With the seventh hell snuffing your soul out of existence for being an unrepentant fool that only brings pain and misery. But that's a principle that was only made popular by a playwright in the sixth astral era, and I can't remember their name for the life of me. <laughs> Speaking of names, is this the author you've been looking for? Uh, let me look. Yes. Wonderful work. I was sure we'd be here for a few hours at least. Guess Thaliak is happy to see us spreading knowledge and wants to contribute. I guess so. Think the Twelve, right? Indeed, my friend. Hello, everyone! Thanks for staying to the end of the lesson. 
If you enjoyed this and want to see more, subscribe and like this video to let me know I'm doing well. If there is a topic you'd want me to cover in the future, leave a comment about it and I'll see what I can do. Until next we meet, I'll be researching even more of our world's rich lore to share with you. Till then, stay safe my friends!